Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. Entitled Parent tries to force me to put her brat in my movie. After that, keep leaving all the work to your group members? This teacher is tired of your crap. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen will get her Lincoln Navigator repossessed. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And huge shout out to Tyson, our newest channel member. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Become a member today and I'll give you a special shout out in our next video. Entitled Parent tries to force me to put her brat in my movie. Context. I am an editor. I have a degree in editing and directing. I make movies. Pretty simple to understand. Now, what you probably also gathered is that I am not anywhere close to famous and that the movies I work on are mostly my own. Many documentaries and corporate videos to pay the bills and short films. Never anything feature length or using crews larger than a dozen people or expecting hundreds of thousands to even see our stuff. And that is where this comes in. I am editing a video for someone else pro bono. Don't ever tell people you do this. I am doing it in public, which this is only the second time outside of college I have ever done this and was only done because my roommate also needed to study for a test and our power was out for some city scheduled thing. Otherwise, I wouldn't be at a cafe since I dislike coffee. He needed a book and a light and I needed an outlet. So we sat far away from each other in this place. Oh well, not really a thing to worry about. Well, this is a high traffic part of town and popular to boot, so the likelihood I see someone I might know isn't too low, and lo and behold, entitled parent and entitled kid. Gonna keep some identifying details vague from here on, including small dialogue changes. So in walks our entitled parent. They're walking in tow with their daughter, maybe 14 or 15. Now, I know this entitled parent through another family member who knows everyone, but I've only met them twice. Once was just a minor introduction, along with about a dozen others, and the only time we spoke beyond that was when I was trying out with freelance and generic getting to know each other conversation at a huge family and friends event. My relative tends to be very energetic and hyperbolic and talks everything up enthusiastically. You probably know the type. So chances are in an effort to brag on my behalf, probably told them I am the best editor this side of Hollywood. They see me long before I see them and I'm just trying to sync a section of video to some music to be in rhythm and putting far too much energy and concentration into this 32 frame section of video. I get startled when suddenly they're both in front of me saying hi. I say it back, shocked at the social interaction I know I have to deal with. I'm not a social butterfly. Entitled Parent Hi Krieg, it's good to see you after so long. Me. Whoa, uh, hey. Well, this is fairly unexpected. What brings you here? I thought you lived up north. Just got done visiting your relative to get them to help me with my yard. Me. Oh, gotcha. To Entitled Kid. Hey, I'm Krieg by the way. I'm Entitled Kid. Yes, sorry, this is my daughter. She's in theater and doing a play outside of school down here. Me. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I was not in theater, but some of my friends were way back in high school. Entitled Parent Honey, he makes movies now. I'm halfway between embarrassed that I'm dealing with a teenager and having an entitled parent talk about me and trying to fight back the massive ego boost that now wants to talk their ear off about movies. I don't talk much unless I get excitable, which I'm trying to avoid. Me Oh, Noah's exhale. Yeah, I do on occasion when I'm lucky. I am working on one right now, trying to get the cuts and actions to sync up with the music in the scene. Entitled Parent Oh, really? A music video? Me Oh no, a fight scene in a drama. I'm just going too far with the editing because a long time ago my last editing mentor told me I was more intuitive with editing, not just on beat, but in rhythm with music and said it's kind of one of my specialties, and I kind of took that notion a little too far. So now I'm editing this scene a little too much if that makes sense. But it's easier to remove than to add. Besides, you can almost make the actions of the actors look better and more rehearsed, like a flow from a play or a dance, if you cut in good pacing with music. The scene becomes its own beast, as long as it doesn't stand out too much stylistically from the rest of the movie. Entitled Kid's eyes are wide open and locked on me, but maybe not in an enamored way. Possibly in the, geez, I wasn't expecting that kind of way. Entitled Parent is just grinning and laughs a little and asks to sit down. 
I say sure and scoot my computer closer to me. Entitled parent. So, I actually have something to ask you since I've trapped you here. Me. Shoot. Entitled parent. I want you to put Entitled Kid in one of your movies. Me. Shocked exhale. Oh, yeah? Um, I stall since I've always imagined this scenario of people asking to be in my movie either as an entitled jerk or begging, and I always figured how I would approach it depending on whether they were strangers or close friends or family. But now that it is someone I kind of know, and since those were all fantasy arguments, I am at a total loss as to how I can say no. I mean, part of me also thought to humor them, but I also just wanted to not put in the effort and stress and say no. I know, I know, everyone wants to be in a big Hollywood film, but I am not going to beg to put them in. Me. Oh yeah, thanks. I know you don't make big movies just yet, but you know that she is an actual actress and even got parts in an outside play, so you don't exactly have to fret. Well, I mean, the actors we use these days are all from a website where we put up audition notices, and even ones we've used before, we make audition again because the roles are all different, and I can't force the director to choose someone. I thought you made the movies. I do make the movies. I am the editor. I literally make them. Entitled Kid. I was told you made real movies, like the director. Honey, let me handle this. Me. Handle what? I just want her in whatever you make next, even if it's small or her part is small, just so she can get some exposure. You can pay her in that exposure even. Me. Well, exposure is never a good payment in this industry. Again. Never tell when you do free favors. But that won't even matter. This movie is only going to be seen by a few thousand at most if it gets into a film festival or it gets some online traffic. Entitled Parent Your relative said you did bigger stuff. They were just exaggerating. Also, did they actually say big stuff or did you just interpret that? Because big for me is how well received a video is, not it being literally a two-hour high-budget film. Entitled Kid Oh, so you lied. You aren't even some big filmmaker. Me. I'm sorry that you thought that, but I do make movies. Entitled parent, sounding disappointed. Well then, you just have to put her in the one you think is going to be the one going to film festivals. Me. Excuse me? I'm sorry, but I just said I am the editor. I work after all that stuff is decided and filmed. Did you lie to your relative? No, I... Ugh. Sorry, trying to keep my cool here. I didn't. I do direct too, but I get more work as an editor, which frankly I am more skilled at. I didn't expect such an ego on you. What ego? To admit I'm better at being an editor versus a director, which is more prestigious? I'm sorry, but I actually do need to finish this movie. Entitled Kid Hey, I thought you heard my mom. Just put me in. I can act. I don't see why it's such a big deal. Me. I'm sorry but she'd have to audition just like everyone else and I'm usually attached to stuff with older actors anyway and you're just a little too young. Entitled Parent I guess that's that. I am sorry you can't see that potential in her. This could have helped both of you. Me You know what, Entitled Parent? I don't do favors. Hypocrite You are the very first person to ever ask me to put someone in a movie and I quiet down because I was about to cause a scene. I really didn't know how to handle this. What did you expect me to do? Get her apart over someone else for a 5 minute video? Or worse, a 20 minute serious short film where the director suddenly doesn't get to direct his movie properly? Entitled Parent Then put her in one of yours. I'm sorry, but I will not be spoken down to. Please leave me alone. You are now interrupting my work. Entitled Kid Oh, now we're interrupting? What I really wanted to say was, you don't know me, and I certainly don't owe you or your little brat. But instead, I just grunted in the affirmative. Let's go. Clearly, he's not going to give you a shot. Entitled Kid. We're better off, as if he thinks he's going to be big. They get up to leave. Me. Wait, were you going to ask me this anyway, and just got lucky seeing me here? It would have been a favor to you as much as to us, but we can't deal with your unprofessional attitude. Me. You know... I made my relatives promo. They know about my professionalism, so don't pretend that it's my fault she isn't going to break into movies. Just let this go. I don't want you affecting my relationship with my relative. Have a good day. Through gritted teeth. They left. My roommate was none the wiser, 
The people next to us gave me odd looks later, as I'm sure they began eavesdropping somewhere along the way, and I got a little vindication that I told them off, I guess, but it doesn't end there. My relative got word of it about a week later and apologized to me and promised to take me out to a fancy dinner with some people to make film connections with. That still hasn't happened, cause I think I'm his film guy. But it's cool, cause they exaggerate, and at least meant well. But I heard through the grapevine that my relative decided the work they helped with would be full price rather than at a discounted cost, which is the little revenge we can exact while still being cordial. So I'll take it. Also, the entitled kids play? Well, we decided a spur of the moment barbecue so we couldn't attend was also necessary. So now I'll never know what the acting prodigy I just said no to can do. Have you ever acted in a play or a movie or anything like that? If so, please let me know, I'd love to hear about it. Keep leaving all of the work to your group members? This teacher is tired of your crap. Backstory. I've been teaching for many years, but it's important to understand that in my first year of teaching, I got put on blast by an elite group of entitled parents and their entitled kids. Not a week went by without someone either demanding my job, trying to undermine me, or just calling me a piece of crap. I nearly quit halfway through the first semester, it just got so bad. This was at a school in a tough area, so I was accused of being unfair constantly for asking kids to stop talking, was ripped into for giving failing grades for missing work, and even enforcing the rules in the student slash parent handbook got me in hot water. My principal reprimanded me for being a negative influence on the school and I was told that I needed to let more rules slide because he was tired of hearing from parents. I would have parents just show up unannounced to sit in on my lessons and then tell me I was a bad educator, a bad human being, etc. I have plenty of horror stories from that school alone, but the point I want to make is that this experience defined the kind of teacher I became going forward to my next school. I needed to be that person who was untouchable because I needed to focus on the one job that mattered, teaching kids. My next school was in a fairly affluent area. It wasn't uncommon for me to find that my students' parents made millions, which brought its own unique set of problems. However, my new principal was super supportive of me as long as I followed the school's handbook to the letter, because by doing so, I was in line with the school's philosophy and protected by law. We seriously had parents filing frivolous lawsuits all the time. This school had long ago learned that caving to parents' demands spilled blood in the water and brought the rest of the sharks in droves. My first year at this new school was successful for many reasons, but primarily because the school culture was easily adapted to. By planning ahead, I was able to head off 99% of all negative parents at the pass. The few times a parent tried to rip into me at conferences, I ripped back so hard that I developed a reputation among the kids and parents as someone you couldn't mess with. Everything I did was in line with the rules, and any attempt to take me down got stonewalled by my principal, who would have to say, Mr. Fighter Jet is following school policy, so I'm afraid the ultimate decision is his. No joke, I had some parents in tears because their kid could no longer get an A in my class. I wasn't the teacher who wanted to destroy the students, I just wanted them to be accountable, and sometimes that meant letting them fail. Needless to say, this job became a lot of fun, because instead of waiting to be ambushed by parents, I could work on making my class fun for my students while still teaching them something. I made ironclad rules for the classroom that broke to little argument and would adapt the following year to make it harder for students or parents to ruin my day. I have many stories like this, but this is one of my favorites. The backstory. The year this happened, I taught a high school class with grades 9 through 12. That's 14 through 18 year olds for you overseas guests. My class wasn't necessary to graduate, but did count as a core requirement. One of my beginning of the year rules was, I never want to hear, when will we ever need this? Because you didn't have to sign up for this class. How I structure my class is that I try to make students accountable for their own actions. My class was built so that it had something to offer everybody. If you tried your best, you were guaranteed a C. If you worked really hard, you could get a B or an A. I would bust my butt to help a student with any reasonable request. The best example of this was a student that was working hard on an assignment and said, I think I understand it now, but can't turn it in on time. To which I answered, then turn it in tomorrow for full credit. This is how hard work pays off. Other than a few hard deadlines in my class, I would do whatever it took to see you learn the material. Mess around in my class? 
I've already found ways to run circles around your pathetic excuses you throw at your parents for your poor performance. It sounds callous, but I was the teacher who would stay for 90 minutes after school to help you catch up, to help fix your project for another class, or even to listen to you cry about your parents' divorce. If I caught you goofing in class instead of doing your work, my rule was that at least 70% of class time was intended for homework, quizzes, etc. I would warn you a couple times, email your parents, and then wait and see if they even gave a crap. If they didn't, I would let you keep digging that hole until you were hip deep in water and begging for a ladder. And then I would toss you a rope instead. You could still climb it if you tried hard enough, but a lot of students would just cry until that hole caved in and buried them. I also utilized my school's online grading slash assignment system for nearly all of my assignments, which meant I could document when a student looked at the assignment, how long it took them, etc. All of this allowed me to see what my students were doing and when they did it, and also if they were plagiarizing. This was one of the tools that helped me make important decisions about leniency, and also allowed me to say things at conferences such as, of course the test was hard. Your kid didn't attempt the nine homework assignments until 11 p.m. the night before the test. Being able to prove that a student wasn't trying made it impossible for blame to be laid unfairly at my feet. It also meant the worst kids avoided my class. Bonus. However, this year something magical happened. Every other year, I would get a wave of kids who just wanted to mess around and blame everyone else for doing poorly. At the end of the year, students would talk crap about me. My class sizes would drop the following year. Then I would receive high praise from those students, so everyone would sign up. So on and so on. But this year, not only did I get a giant wave of knuckleheads, but they came with parents who loved to make trouble. I had already heard tales of some of these parents. Other teachers were just dying to hear stories about our interactions because these parents were very much entitled. They would name drop lawyers when they didn't get their way, try to badger teachers into giving their kids extra credit, and would largely deny any wrongdoings on their kids' part. These were the parents who would get called in because their student was busted cheating then accused the teacher of making the class too hard, therefore validating their student's need to cheat. So, about these knuckleheads. It was a group of roughly seven senior boys who all shifted their schedules to be in the same period with each other. The other teachers could not believe that I had all of them at the same time, but I just shrugged it off. Every week, the staff lounge was dying to know how I dealt with their shenanigans, but for the most part, I had shut down most of their crap from day one. I actually got along very well with them, despite their constant goofing, because they had mastered the ability to appear busy and didn't distract my other kids. Then came the first group project. My class size was just right for seven groups of four to form. The idiot collective formed two groups of four by pulling in a kid who had been absent on the first day of the project. These two groups crashed and burned on this project super hard for several reasons, but the biggest reasons were that A, they messed around during class time, and B, put off a two-week assignment until the weekend before and then dumped all the work on everybody else, which resulted in everyone doing minimal effort. I handed out the bad grades and was immediately pulled into parent conferences with several of them, one at a time, obviously. Every meeting was the same. My kid did all the work, so he doesn't deserve a bad grade. Or, my kid didn't understand the assignment, to which I handed over my hyper-specific rubric, which is a checklist for how I grade things. I never wanted to be accused of grading based on not liking someone. These largely went like this. My kid did all the work, and I don't think it's fair it should hurt his grade. Me. Here is the work your student turned in. Hands it over. Here is my rubric, which I printed and emailed to your student the day the project started. Hands it over. As you can see, I have itemized the grading for ease of use. I would be happy to go over the grade your student earned. Entitled parent. Reads through all the evidence. Looks at kid. Where are the missing parts? Student. Uh, my group members were responsible for that. Me. I can't grade what I never received, so I can't reasonably just raise your kid's grade. Sorry. Now, good news for all my students. I make assignments worth more throughout the semester with the idea that kids who mess up early can make up for it later by working hard. I seed extra credit throughout the semester and all of these parents are disgruntled, but happy to hear that their entitled embryo can still get an A in my class. Now, the end result of these meetings was that it clearly wasn't my fault. Remember, I had all this data to prove that I made every effort to contact everybody, etc. So it must be the other kid's fault. 
So these parents all decide that their perfect angel is no longer allowed to work with their previous group mates. Like a cancer, this failure of friends distributes through the rest of the class. Like the genius that I am, I make my students write a group contract for every project that details who does what and when it is due. Why is this important? Because the contract provides me the documentation necessary to allow me to dismiss a bad group member and give them a zero without their parent ruining my day. So here is where the problem begins manifesting. These seniors begin bouncing from group to group like cancerous ping pong balls, wreaking havoc. I let students choose their groups, so these seniors are desperately integrating with anybody that will have them. Because of my class size, every group has at least one coddled kid to deal with, and these kids just end up rotating until all of my students have worked with one of these seniors at some point. Now, I'm getting constant complaints from parents of other kids about these boys. Their kid wanted a good grade, which means they ended up doing all the work while the senior lacked. This is usually after the fact, at which time I bring up, I would love to yank that leech out of your grade pool, but you have to use the contract. Students don't want to say anything because they fear retribution from the seniors, but I can't do anything because I will be accused of harassment. The contract can provide me with the leverage I need to prove that these kids were doing no work because these seniors have been playing their parents for years. I make my class utilize Google Docs because the changes are timestamped. No joke, I've had students produce all the work the morning of a parent meeting to try and lie their way out and make me look like a jerk, but that timestamp is a godsend. Luckily, my class is balanced. A crappy group mate can make things hard, but not undoable, and parents are appeased that I have an out for their student, but disappointed that their kid doesn't use it. Every time I announce a group project is on the way, some of these seniors sucker up to the other kids to the point that it's expected that a spot will be made for them. I'm talking buying kids lunch, bringing them gifts, etc. Seriously, the day before a group project starts, all of the seniors now sit at separate tables from each other so that they could all pull the I'm already here, let's be in a group card, which works most of the time. The strain on class morale is difficult, but I am biding my time. The other students are grabbing at extra credit opportunities constantly so that their grade can absorb the blow. And parent complaints are completely mitigated because I am still offering every chance for success. My principal has a copy of my syllabus in his computer so that he can quote student policies that the parent signed off on. Not uncommon for him to hear, I don't read that crap so it doesn't apply. But he reminds them that the clause above the signature line says, my signature denotes that I have read this document in its entirety and agree to abide by all the rules, or something similar, and that this should be a lesson to the parent and the student that when you sign something, you should read the fine print. If you ever become a teacher, find an awesome boss like this and stick by their side. The Setup So I have seven slothful seniors, but I shall name the worst of these Larry, Curly, and Mo. The fallout affects all of them, but these are the ones whose parents love to make the most trouble. Every time they bully a teacher into compliance, I imagine they sit around a smoking room with cigars and cognac, laughing at how they got their way yet again with a lowly teacher. I know that anything I do will be heavily scrutinized once the grades start failing and I need to be able to shrug it off because I have other things to do, and I refuse to be the smiling topic of discussion in their circle. However, a special note about Larry, since he turned 18, his parents now travel non-stop and are impossible to reach, Larry is now just a huge jerk because his parents no longer care about what he does. I closely monitor their grades in my class, but also in others. This may sound sketchy, but I routinely do this with any of my students who struggle with the material so that I can identify if the issue is my class or all of their classes. Students have been known to fake their grades using Inspect Element, and I got tired of hearing, but they have A's in their other classes, because then I look like the jerk. Anyway, after a check, I speak with the other teachers. It isn't hard to find out that these boys are doing minimal work in other classes, and I actually discover that Larry has been finding ways to get other kids to do the work for him and then disseminating it among his friends. Other teachers have been bullied into lowering test percentages in their class, and guess what? He and his friends are enrolled in these classes. Despite bombing these classes, homework and project grades give them a comfortable cushion so that most of them are floating at low Bs. I can't prove this. They are using Snapchat. But when I bring it up with their teachers, the teachers don't feel like trying to prove it and duke it out with the parents. Now, they are gaming other classes for minimal effort. However, their only recourse in my class is to keep rotating through groups and leeching off of their hard work to maintain C's and B's, 
and the other kids are too nervous to utilize the group contract to get them fired. However, remember how I mentioned that I steadily increase the value of my assignments to keep kids working and give them a chance to fix their grades? Me, random day in class. Hey everybody, I was looking in the schedule and realized that your last project before finals may stress you out unnecessarily. Would anybody mind if I dropped it? My class, tired of getting banged on group assignments. Nope, drop it, best teacher ever. Me, okay. Well, just so you know, I'm going to move our next project back a couple of weeks and extend the deadline by a week. Also, since I canceled the last project, this means that the next project will now be worth roughly 20% of your final grade, so do your best. Messing this up could hurt your grade. My class. Whatever. JPEG. So in one step, I have inflated this assignment and also moved it. I send out an email to parents and students letting them know about the change to the syllabus and the assignment get no responses other than happiness that I am removing stress from the end of the semester, etc. I actually did this primarily because another teacher, who was a huge jerk, plunked down a monster project that same week and I knew it would burn out my students prior to finals, so figured a break was in order. Win-win for me, really. Now, why did I move it? Maniacal laughter MP4. The Friday before the project started, I announced at the start of class, Okay, I am introducing the project now so that you can get into groups today and we can do it first thing Monday morning without delay, since this project is so important. This announcement elicits a room full of crap-eating grins. Why? It was senior ditch day. Our school didn't condone a ditch day, so the kids tried their best to keep it a secret, but I found out a month in advance. All seven of these kids were absent from class, which meant that I had just given the entire room freedom from these dead weights. Immediately, groups are formed, and even better, I had a couple kids transfer out of my class that semester, which meant, number-wise, these knuckleheads will have to work on this last group project together, in two groups. I emphasized that everyone needed to get to class as soon as possible, so that they could start as soon as attendance was called. My original intention was to light a giant fire under all seven of these chumps, to get them to actually put in the effort they had neglected to do all year. Most of them had grades in the low C range, except for one in the low Bs. As a bonus to all my students, I put an extra credit portion on this project so that they could recoup their early semester losses, but also allow these seniors to do very well if they put in the effort. This wasn't meant to be a revenge tale, but an attempt to give them one last lesson in responsibility. Before the end of the day, I send out a parent's student notification that the project had been started and that any absent students needed to contact their classmates to establish groups before Monday morning. This was important, as you'll see. I'm sure you can guess what happened next. Immediate fallout. The next Monday, the seniors came traipsing in seconds before the bell to discover that there are only two tables to sit at. Whatever, they take their seats. Me, after attendance. Okay, everybody has a copy of the rubric, so go ahead and get started. Rest of class immediately pulls out rubric. Seniors, looking around frantically. The seniors quickly realize that they have been played and the arguing starts. First thing that happens is that Larry, Curly, and Mo decide that they now belong with whoever they happen to be sitting with and scoot their chairs over to sit with different tables. I catch this right away and tell them that the groups are already at maximum size, four people per group. The other four seniors are already fighting with each other because they know that none of them will actually do any work. Larry, who thinks he's God's gift to everybody, tries to sweet talk me and his group into special privileges and allowing a group of five. Now, I see some of the other kids wavering and I know that Larry is putting pressure on them to argue his case. I designed this project for specifically four people and had a job for each one, but I extended a separate offer. I will let you join, but since there will be five of you, I expect double the work. Literally, I told them they would have to do the project twice. Larry tries to argue, but I point out the roles I have established and inform him that if four people could do it once, having five should make it easier to do it twice. Sounds like a jerk move on my part, but I have now intimidated the other kids into saying, heck no, and even have them put it to a vote. Unsurprisingly, Larry is the only one who votes that this is a good idea, and when the other kids catch wind of my offer, they physically shoo off the other seniors trying to pull this deal as well. You will all be delighted to hear that the rest of my period for my seniors is spent arguing over who will work with who. They end up forming three groups and I nod my head, make sure they have the rubric, and then wish them the best of luck. Being the smart teacher that I am, I email Curly's parents and Mo's mommy that they have chosen to work with each other. Mo's mommy shows up to argue with me all the time, but has quickly learned I won't take her crap. 
At a previous meeting, she even laid into Mo and told him, I'm tired of fighting all these battles with your teachers, and I'm starting to think that you're the problem. But I suspect this is for show. Curly's parents email me back and say they will make sure Curly writes a group contract. You see, Curly has sold himself as the best student ever, and clearly he will do the work and fire his classmates. Mo's mommy immediately requests a meeting with me. Per school policy, I do not have to respond to an email for 48 hours. I wait until hour 47 and email a non-committal, I would love to meet, when are you available, and wait for a response. I then wait another 48 hours to inform her of a time the following week that works for me. Now, some of the other senior parents have emailed me angrily, demanding why I let their kids choose to work with the bad kids again. I had to inform them that I didn't expect all of them to be absent. Immediately, some of my seniors get burned at home because they ditched and their parents tell me, just try to help them pass, which I agree to. Some of them need this class for graduation, after all. Mo's mommy, on the other hand, shows up ready to wage war. She starts by demanding that I put Mo in a different group. I decline because the project has now been going on for a week and it wouldn't be fair. She demands that I add him to another group. They're all full and students have already done the lion's share of the work. She demands that I let him work by himself with an extension. I gladly offer him an extension and slide a copy of the rubric over to him and he goes white. At this point, he knows that he is never planning to do any of the work. In fact, I know that his group hasn't even started. I have a copy of their group contract which was hastily scribbled in pencil with no due dates on it. He starts arguing with his mom that he would rather work with his friends and that he is upset that he got stuck in this situation. Contemplating this, she accuses me of deliberately waiting until that day to do over the seniors. After all, it was a school sanctioned event and I'm being a jerk about it and she'll go to the board with her story. Wrong. The joy I get from all my prep work is shutting down BS like this. All seven of the seniors hung out on ditch day at her house and told her that the principal had given them the day off. Even better, they called in and pretended to be their own parents so that it was an excused absence. He is immediately busted and his mom flips her switch and jumps all over him. You see, she can keep pressing me on this issue, but I now have evidence that he pretended to be his own dad and this is a suspendable offense. I buy myself into her graces by telling her that I had no idea that senior ditch day was that Friday but I gave her kid a free extension on the homework that was due because I thought seniors deserved their own traditions, blah, blah, blah. She buys it. Also, I can prove that I emailed him and her and gave them plenty of notice before Monday morning that they needed to pick groups before something like this happened. Obviously, once I found out about Ditch Day, I tried to give her precious treasure a heads up, but I don't know why he didn't take it. She makes him open his email. My email is sitting there unopened and I have won this battle. She thanks me and takes him home. Class morale is super high unless you are one of the seniors. A week before the project is due, neither group has actually started and the HMS class average is about to hit an iceberg. The project comes due. It comes as no surprise that my enterprising seniors have turned in easily some of their worst work ever. One group got into a text argument the weekend before it was due and made one of the kids do all the work. Larry and Curly are in this group. The other group, with Mo, have also turned into a steaming pile. I make sure to grade these two projects first because I know the fallout is going to be big. All the seniors dropped at least one letter grade, a couple dropped two. This is four weeks before graduation. Larry appears to take his F- in stride. They got something like a 10% on it, so I know he's plotting something. Curly's parents demand a meeting and so does Mo's mommy. Curly's parents are super upset that they got a bad grade and demanded to know why. What they didn't know was that I had already met with a student who did the entire project, poorly, and his parents. I informed Curly's parents that I had seen the text exchange between the seniors that pretty much ended up with, you do it. Curly refused to turn over his phone to his parents for confirmation. I also show them Curly's project and hand over the rubric. Mom and dad are not happy. You see, Curly has been blaming everyone else for his mistakes since the dawn of time and his parents have bought in completely, until today. Dad pointedly asks, what part did you do? And this causes Curly to spout actual tears. I then pull up a spreadsheet of all the group project scores from the year with no student data and have highlighted his scores, which are among the worst. The purpose of this was to use data to prove that their son, frankly, never does the work. Curly is absolutely destroyed by this. His parents kick him out of the conference because they are tired of his excuses and ask me what they can do. 
I tell them I would be happy to offer one-on-one -on -one tutoring and that he can still pass the class if he does his homework and gets a B on the next exam. They agree to this. We all shake hands and they leave. Curly's story largely ends here. He never shows up to tutoring and I email his parents. After three emails, his dad finally responds with, his mom and I have decided that he needs to learn to be an adult and are leaving him to his own devices. Thank you for your efforts. Curly will spend the rest of the semester doing little to no work. Because he is grounded at home, he is now just watching YouTube videos on his phone during school. The ripple effect is glorious because now Curly is doing this in all of his classes. I speak with his teachers and they all email that he has quit doing work in class and get the same reply I did rather than the vehement responses they are used to. When Curly fails his classes, he still graduates, but his parents have informed him that they are no longer paying for his college and it's time to get a job. Moe's mommy flips her crap and demands answers. Unfortunately, Mo is in the same group as Curly and she gets the same answers from me. Strangely enough, once she's exhausted every effort and attempt to somehow blame me for this, she admits that she knew Mo was part of bullying the lone senior and that he should be ashamed of himself. She deliberately tried to play me but outed herself once she knew that I already knew everything. Super annoying, but I agree to help tutor him one-on-one, -on -one, which makes her happy. Long-term fallout. Mo's mommy is emailing me every few days now. Is my son doing his work? Did he get help with his homework? Etc. Non-stop. But she knows better than to fight with me. Larry is unusually chipper and is no longer doing his work. I find out that Larry is supposedly going to a college where he just needs to maintain his GPA over a super low number. He claims an F in my class won't change anything, so I make sure he doesn't distract the others. Mo shows up only occasionally, but strangely enough, Larry pops in just to say hi whenever Mo is getting help. I can't fathom why he does this, but suspect he is up to something and already have a backup plan in place. You see, Mo's mommy is nuts, and I make sure that there's always another person in the room with me when I tutor him. Anyway, Mo's mommy is constantly checking in. I start waiting 48 hours between emails, cause I can, and she starts dropping by in person unannounced to check on him. Me. She's been acting cagey lately, and I'm starting to suspect something. It's Larry. Larry is a friend of Moe's, so he's been in her home feeding her made-up stories to convince her that I have been a jerk to Mo when other students aren't around. Stuff like I was calling him names after school, etc. This starts a whole thing where she is now demanding answers from admin, but Mr. Fighter Jet is smart. Admin asks me about details regarding my interactions with Mo, and I end up sitting down with my principal, Mo, and Mo's mommy. She details that Mo is struggling, might not graduate, and that she believes I have singled her kid out and wants his grade raised. You see, Mo is dumb and lazy, and his mom is just as bad. When Larry went to her with his story, she never bothered talking about it with her own son. She just agreed and went along with it. So I asked Mo point blank to please describe what has been said during our sessions and then offer to leave the room so that he can tell the principal without me there. She tells me to stay because she wants me to hear from Mo what I've done to him. What neither of them knew was that I was a mentor teacher. That meant I had a first year teacher as my mentee, not a student teacher, but a new hire that works with a veteran teacher to learn the ropes of our school. And I had her working on grades and such in my room after school. You need so many contact hours on the days I agreed to meet Mo. She was younger, so Mo thought she was another student and never questioned it and couldn't even remember that she was in there. My principal already had statements from her detailing my interactions with Mo and Mo was unable to give any actual details and suddenly forgot what had been said to him. This lands her in hot water with Admin, and she blames the whole thing on Larry and becomes visibly upset that she fell for such a stupid ruse. After that meeting, Larry is now suddenly super concerned about his grade. I rationalize that he was hoping to burn me out of my job and then use the fallout to get a free passing grade. Obviously, it didn't work. So, forget Larry. I have kids who actually want to succeed. My free days are now on days I know he works and he never shows up for tutoring anyway. Now that other teachers are hesitant to meet with him, he is unable to cut deals to raise those grades either. Seriously, teachers fell for his change of heart spiel every semester. Mo's mom makes a last ditch effort and tries to convince me that the parents of the seniors have scheduled a meeting with my boss to have me fired for giving their kids a bad grade and that she would be willing to put in a good word for me if I meet with her first. I'm sitting next to the principal when I get this email through an app on my cell phone and he has no idea what she's talking about. I tell her I'd be happy to meet everybody, but that I would probably eat my lunch during such a meeting and that I hoped people didn't mind the smell of fish. I get a, no, seriously, 
They are threatening to sue you, but feigned stupidity and informed her that I couldn't be sued for eating fish during a meeting. She now realizes I give zero hoots about anything and can't be threatened. Again, there's nothing she can do because I'm simply following policy. The last few weeks are frantic for these seniors. One by one, they fall because they've done little to no work for a couple years now and they have no idea how to apply themselves. Other teachers are emboldened by how hard I shut them down and finally hold them accountable. A few of them just barely manage D's in my class, the rest fail. I get a few last second squeaks of, what can I do to raise my grade? But have now documented that none of them attempted the extra credit assignments and that was their chance. It's hard for a parent to crap on you when you can prove you actually tried to give their student extra credit and can then prove they never opened the assignment outline. These guys are now failing some of their other classes. A couple have breakdowns in my class and leave crying. Their friendships are fracturing with each other because they now all hate each other from what happened, which they will get over during the summertime. My last test came and I made it an online multiple choice test. It was easy enough to have the questions and answers shuffled in random order, meaning they couldn't cheat off each other. You see, I knew for a long time that they would sit next to each other to try and cheat on the exam, and Larry had blown a ton of money on a tutor to try and carry his friends. This throws them all off, and when Mo's mommy accuses me, again, of trying to trick her kid with a much harder test, it was easy enough to shoo her away with a simple email. Larry passes the exam, but his grade moves up to a meager D-. The results. If you're still here, congratulations on dealing with my wall of text. Here are the results. Of the seven seniors, one didn't graduate and had to transfer schools. His parents were embarrassed that they paid to fly the whole family out for a graduation that he didn't get to take part in. Two of the seniors lost all of their scholarships and could no longer attend the schools they wanted. Their fallback plan was to attend the same school together and become roommates, which they did with three of the other seniors, including Mo. I do have some after stories because I still work at this school and occasionally hear from the kids who graduated. Larry's college was not happy with his final GPA. I'm not sure what his long game was, but it sucked. The college kicked him out before he could even start and I found out his huge web of lies extended to his parents too. He toured Europe over the summer and tried to surprise his parents by coming home instead of going to school. Apparently, they kicked him out immediately after because they were selling their house to get a condo somewhere else. Remember, they travel for work all the time now so wanted to downgrade. Last I heard, he made up a story that he joined the military but got released due to a made up illness. I say made up because I heard this tale from three different people and each one was given a different disease. Curly's parents relented and decided to pay for Curly to go to college after all. Curly got kicked out halfway through the year and they kicked him to the curb after living at home for a year and refusing to get a job. Last I heard, he works in a vape shop. Mo went to school and used his book smarts to try and pay other kids to do his work for him. His mommy is rich. When that failed, he faked his grades to get his mom to keep footing the bill. Eventually, the school kicked him out and he moved back home. The story his mommy told a friend of hers, who I ran into, was that he decided that he would rather be an entrepreneur rather than go to college and that he bought a drone to film weddings with. Last I heard, he was committing crimes. His mommy thinks he is working weddings. One senior went to college with his friends and immediately realized he needed to change. He quit hanging out with his friends and, last I heard, graduated with honors in a lucrative field. He emailed me once to thank me for challenging him in high school because it prepared him for college, so that was nice. That's it, the end. Thanks for reading. And if you ever had a teacher you loved, send them an email. We love hearing from our students. And shout outs to our Read Generals of the Day, Jennifer, Faded Diamond Dust, and Shahar Byrne. Become tomorrow's Read Generals by leaving as many reads as you can in the comments below, and please listen to my playlist every night when you go to sleep.